So, hello everyone. I was never introduced as stand-up comedians. They called me everything, but not stand-up comedians. <laughs> thank you, Pablo. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you everybody for showing up. Uh, thank you to Connie in first row. She just finished her presentation three minutes ago. So I'm super relaxed. She's kind of uneasy. I don't know why. Uh, okay, thank you everyone for, for showing up. Uh, basically, I've done this type of presentation uh, last year already. What you see here is Postgres uh, performance stuff. What I say? Uh, Postgres performance tips you've never seen before, version 2.0. So who was there in Berlin last year? Oh, wonderful. Uh, who has seen version 1.0? Glad you're back. It's just 400 people missing, but that's fine. Okay. So, uh, version 2.0 of stuff you might hopefully have not seen before. So, uh, we are a Postgres company, as you might have noticed, right? And as Pablo said, I'm kind of Postgres consultant. So, we are kind of international. So, I think that's kind of the whole world here. So, we should be fine. We got a couple of customers. They're all cool. Everybody loves us, right? Let's not worry. So, the, the motivation here is really quite simple. Everybody is talking, you know, performance, increased memory, better hardware, you know, this type of stuff. That's super boring, right? Everybody knows that better hardware will change stuff, you know. Everybody knows that if you throw more CPUs at the problem, it's usually not going to get worse, right? In adding more memory, you know, wonderful, what a wonderful tuning advice. We would have never thought about this before, right? So this is exactly what this is not about. So I will try to show you some stuff which can be beneficial in some cases, right? Which might not be beneficial in many other cases and which might be just entertaining, right? After all, it's a conference, everybody's away from home, so it's kind of pre-party, right? So let's get started. Uh, I tried to replicate the the, the, the overall layout uh, from, from last year to have a little journey through, through things, right? And usually, database work starts when you create a connection, right? So what can possibly go wrong when you create a connection? Any ideas, anybody? No, that's fine. So, any connection. So what we see here is in, um, in Postgres, when we start a connection, what Postgres does is it's going to fork a process, right? So if you look at this thing at the C level, it says while socket accept fork, bloop, you make a new process. So Postgres is a multi-process architecture, so every connection is going to be a process and stuff like that, right? So what, what can we do to, to, to make life for the user better, right? Last year at this stage, I've been speaking about latency. This year, we found something else which is rarely used, but which is super, super useful. Uh, the slides just finished three, weeks ago, three minutes ago, so I have to read what it actually says. Um, so what can we do when we do that? And there is a very underrated uh, variable here, uh, which is loading stuff before you use it, right? That's quite relevant, because if we look at a very simple example here, uh, as you know, in Postgres, we can run server-side code. You know, we can run stored procedures. And the rule is, all those libraries which are involved in running a stored procedure, which is not in SQL, obviously, but some, some other language, what you're basically doing is, you're loading a library. So the biggest library uh, we found here is PLR. Who has been working with R? Statistics package, right? Status, you maybe, right? <laughs> okay, so basically when you, when, you, when you write this kind of function in Postgres, you know, when, when Postgres was made, there was a discussion about which server-side language shall we use, right? And Jan Wieck came up with the idea of PLTickle, right? Who likes PLTickle? Nobody. I mean, it's like, I mean, nobody would admit, you know, it's ugly, right? So obviously what we got in Postgres was the ability to write stuff in basically any language of the face of the earth, right? So you can run stored procedure in Python, uh, Perl, Tickle, <laughs> uh, whatever, right? And there's also this thing called PLR. And 
when this thing was first uh, made by, by Joe Conway, uh, American guy, uh, the, the, the library to run this stuff was four megs, right? So what, what you're doing here is you're loading a four megabyte library into your connection, and this is kind of relevant because we're running a function, just to, to show you, that says if argument number one is greater than argument number two, then return the, the first one, otherwise return the second one. It's just written in R, right? And when, when we do that, when we run that, on first execution, so backslash timing, obviously very, very nice thing here, what we get is the first execution is 220 milliseconds. Because what's happening here is, every time you, you run a new um, programming language, what you do is you load the library, you initialize the library, you, you execute the damn thing, right? And what you see is a slight difference between the second call and the first call, right? And usually, it's not the second call people are complaining about, right? So I've never gotten a support call late at night that says, my second execution was so fast. Can you stop that from happening? Yes, we can. But kind of undesirable, yeah? So what happens here is, so how can we fix that, that if you're opening, let's say, a thousand connections, right? You, you're doing this a thousand times because the library is loaded into the connection, which is a process, which means you're loading this thing a thousand times, right? And a thousand times 200 milliseconds will show up in monitoring eventually. Basically, I consider monitoring to be pointless because many customers are a lot faster on the phone than the monitoring would ever catch it, right? But um, anyway. So in this case, we have 230 milliseconds because the first call is initializing everything. So for a couple of years, Postgres has a means which allows you to load stuff into your connection or into your server before you use that. I mean, some people might have seen that with uh, start statements, which needs shared preload libraries, et cetera. So you might have seen that. But there is also more. There's session preload libraries and then local preload libraries and blah, 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 right? And the point of this whole thing is, eventually, you have to load the library. No question. The question is, does the user notice? You can have bad performance when nobody's watching. If your aggregation job late at night takes three hours or three hours 10, doesn't matter, everybody's asleep, right? But it does matter if they have these nasty things called phones and emails and travel tickets and, you know, complaints and whatever, right? So what we want here really is predictable runtimes, right? Make it stable runtimes, you know? And the way that we do that here is, we tried that with uh, PostGIS, same problem, by the way. So. BLR is just super, super sexy to show because it takes insanely long to initialize and load. But what everybody might be using here, uh, many people, is uh, post-GIS, right? Like uh, geospatial data. And what we see here, we're calculating some, some stuff here which is going to load uh, post-GIS. And this is 10 milliseconds, right? And the second call is a fraction of a millisecond. So the first thing we can do here is basically to fix that is, you see the difference? 10 milliseconds, first call, two milliseconds, second, second time. If we run the thing with uh, session preload libraries with PostGIS loaded. So we have a couple of choices. We can say, hey, when you create this connection, already load this damn library to make sure that it's there so that on the first call, we only have to initialize the library, it's already loaded. And um, if I remember correctly, if you load PostGIS with all the dependencies and stuff, it's something like eight megabytes, you know? So it's not nothing, right? It's not huge, but you know, do it a thousand times, you know? It eventually adds up. So this is a nice way of making sure that your first response is a little bit faster, okay? So that's very nice feature of Postgres. 
very old. I think it's at least 10 years, 15 years. So this is Stone Age. This is nothing new, right? But it's still super useful. It's rarely used. And I think it's, it's quite underrated it in, in what it can do for you. Um, so you can just have session preload libraries, but you can also put uh, uh, shared preload libraries into your Postgres server so that already on startup, the library is loaded, that when new connections are created, the library is already loaded in your connection, right? And this will save a lot of overhead, especially when you're dealing with hundreds or thousands of connections at the same time. So this is one of my favorites. It's rarely known. I've never seen it much in the field, but, but it's super useful in terms of response times. Right, any questions so far? Anybody, anywhere? I see somebody raising his hand in the back. Pablo, can you run more quickly, maybe? Yes. <laughs> faster, faster. Or Pablo, this is a performance so, thing, you yeah? know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, th th this PostGIS library is 8 megabytes. Yes. And you have uh, a thousand connections. Yes. And you preload them. Yes. That's 8 gigabytes of memory that yes. you waste yes. on preloading a library that you maybe use. Yes. Doesn't sound like such a great idea, does <laughs> yes, it? Yes, you just burned a ton of memory. That's why I said before, more memory is always cool, right? Never ask database guy about more memory, right? <laughs> so, but yes, yes, you need, uh, this is in every bloody connection. By the way, the same is true with PL. PGSQL, it's loaded into every connection. So eventually, you have it a thousand times loaded, that's the way it works, right? So the, the thing is, this is eight megabytes. Uh, a a PL, PGSQL is 200 kilobytes, something, something like that, right? It's, it's nothing. But here it really counts, you know? It, it doesn't make a difference. Yes, sir. Pablo, we intentionally chose somebody from the front. So next yeah, guy, please in the back, you know? Sorry. <laughs> question, if those libraries are released uh, from memory, uh, because uh, I have seen situations like uh, ever-growing uh, use of memory uh, by some clients, and uh, we did not find some reasonable explanation, but uh, these uh, preloaded libraries could uh, point in some way. Uh, the thing is, I think what you're seeing is the way Linux mem uh, accounts memory. I think when you look in top and what you see is the memory the process touched and not the memory it allocated. So you have to touch it in order to be accounted, something like that. So it's the way it accounts, right? Okay, so next topic, which might be useful to some of you guys. Yes, thank you. <laughs> is uh, how we can store data. So how can we do that? <coughs> in this case, uh, we can run a little test, right? So I created a very small uh, PGBench database, which is just, you know, just one PGBench init run. And what we did is I was running 25,000 PGBench transactions in four connections against this database, right? So basically what I did is I initialized fresh database, right? Initialized it and ran 100,000 uh, uh, transactions against this database. And I did it with wall level logical versus wall level minimal and max wall size 64 megabytes as opposed to 100 gigs. And the question is, what's going to happen? Obviously, wall size, bigger wall size is faster, right? Because more memory, more storage, you know, always cool, right? And obviously, minimal wall size is also making a, a difference, but there is more here, uh, which is worth inspecting, right? So let's take a look. Let's run this test with wall level logical and run this with 64 megabytes in max wall size. You know, in, in Postgres, the purpose of the transaction log is basically to protect your data files. These days, the write-ahead log is, is often used to, 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 to replicate, to build clusters and stuff like that. But the core purpose, as of Postgres 7.1, I believe, is basically to protect your data file. That's the whole point, right? So the whole point of the write ahead log is if you pull the plug, you want to make sure that your data file is fine, right? No corruption, right? That, that, that's, that's the core idea. And in order to do that, 
we, we write this transaction log, and there is this idea of a checkpoint. So when, when, you, when you're writing to the, uh, to the database, you know, eventually uh, you, will write to the, you will first write to the transaction log, and if it's safe there, at some later point, data is going to end up in the data files. And to make sure that you can reduce, basically shrink your transaction log again, what we do is a so-called checkpoint, right? So when we initialized this thing, we ran 100,000 transactions, we ended up with producing 135 megabytes of transaction log. Okay, that's what it is. <laughs> oh, what happened? Just karma? It blinked? Oh, high availability, no problem. So, um, and the cool thing is you can measure where you are. So we can do PG current wall LSN, so we can measure where we are in the transaction log. And the cool thing is there are operators defined on that, so you can make calculations, right? So from the beginning of time to now, it's 135 megabytes. If you run the same thing again, you know, see the difference? Same test, but with wall level minimal and 100 gig wall size, we only produced 82 megabytes of transaction log. So unless you need replication, logical decoding, whatever, what you're doing here is by reducing the size of the transaction log, you're obviously writing less, right? And writing less is usually quite beneficial to performance, right? Your backups are going to be smaller, whatever, right? Stuff like that. So this is really, really rarely known. And what happens here is minimal will put fewer stuff into your transaction log. So this is going to reduce your overall size. And longer checkpoints are also beneficial, right? So if your checkpoints are further apart, this is not going to only going to increase performance overall during write operations. This is also going to be quite beneficial for the size of your transaction log, because if you what was that? If you if you touch a block after a checkpoint for the first time, you have to log it completely, right? So there's also size difference here. So I highly encourage you to put an eye on that and also see there is an easy way to calculate how much transaction log you you processed. And that's also one takeaway that can be very beneficial, right? So we had preload libraries, uh, we have uh, smaller transaction log. So let's see what, the, what else there is. Indexing, right? Obviously, what is really good for performance is the idea of having indexes, right? And I can assure you one thing. Proper indexing is, by definition, a Boolean thing. A single missing index can absolutely destroy your database, right? Wipe it out from the face of the earth. No matter how many scale up buttons your favorite hyperscaler is going to give you in your cloud, it doesn't matter, right? If you have a billion rows and you forget to use an index, you're going to read a billion entries. If you do that through an index, you're going to read maybe a couple hundred. You know, whatever. So this is not just, oh, I missed an index, I'm 5% slower. No, this, this is 5,000 times slower. It, it can completely wipe you up the face of the earth. A single missing index can feel like absolute downtime, right? So this is not like being a little bit faster. This is live or die, you know, if, if, if your data is sufficiently large. And if something is 50,000 times slower without an index, your scale up button in your favorite hyperscaler is not going to fix it, right? Because if you have one CPU, you have to click the scale up button 50,000 times to make up for a missing index, right? There is no 50,000 core machine. Doesn't exist, right? It's just there is no replacement for brains. I mean vacuum, but that's different concept of vacuum, right? Like, so this is really important, get your indexes right. And there is something uh, that's really interesting to see here is so uh, if we create a table, just one, one ID entry, uh, and then we're going to load 25 million rows, very nice, very simple, everything is cool, uh, we can, of course, create an index. 
And this is dangerous. What I'm showing you here is super dangerous. You have to be perfectly aware of what you're doing here. When you're creating an index on ID, everything is fine. The index itself is by default only 90% full. That's default behavior. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. If you create the index with fill factor 100%, your index is going to be completely full, right? No empty space in your index structure, it's full, which makes your index smaller. But, but, the first change there going to your index means that you have to split the nodes and, and stuff like that. There's a reason why the default fill grade of an index structure is 90%, right? There's a reason for that. But, 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 if you have data that is static by definition, it doesn't change anymore. Imagine you've got a phone book, right? So you have 100 million uh, phone numbers, you index them, and you, 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 you have a static copy of that for 100 years. Right? And when you get a new phone book, five years later, you, you, you rebuild the damn thing, right? Something like that. Something that is super, super static, right? If there are no updates, no inserts, you can do that, right? So if you are sure that your data is not changing by definition because it's some static data set that never changes, I don't know, periodic table, something like that, you know? Uh, well, it's not big enough, but you get the point, right? Uh, you, you can play with fill factor on the index in order to make it smaller, but it has to be bloody static data because otherwise it will suffer on first insert or first update. You know, this, there's a reason why this is 90%. But on static data, this is a very nice trick to, to shave off some stuff. And here, this is a half a gigabyte of data. Imagine you're indexing 50 billion rows, whatever. It's just... 10 extra percentage points you can just nicely shave off uh, on static data that's never changed. Like packets being delivered, they won't be touched anymore, you know, it's last year's petition, things like that. Okay, if it's super static data, you can do that. Okay, there's more. Let's talk about something really nasty, uh, join order. Uh, what we got here is, a couple of tables. So what I'm doing here is I'm too lazy to type create table five times. That's boring. It's even more boring to create uh, to do create table a hundred times, right? It's repetitive. It's it's stupid. So what we can do in Postgres is we can say create table blah 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 from generate series, and what we're doing here is we're generating the SQL, right? Very nice. So we're generating SQL statements. And then what we do is backslash gxec in your psql, and it's going to take the previous result of your query and assume it's SQL, right? So this is very nice. So if you want to generate a million row, a million tables, or a million indexes, or drop a million tables, or make five million partitions, or drop a thousand users, something like that, what you can do is you just generate your SQL statement, right? Just make them. If you don't want to write them, make them. Backslash gxec and is executed, right? Super nice. So what we got here is five tables, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. Okay, so we made ourselves tables. That's a very nice way to test stuff, right? Make a million tables, see what happens, right? Give a million permissions, see what happens, right? Do stuff, right? Very nice feature, very simple. And what happens here is the idea of it behind the SQL is that you are going to write a statement and the engine is miraculously going to find the best way to execute that. So shall we index can, shall we merge join, shall we do nested loop? It's like a priest thing, like, like oh, no, anyway. Uh, so, how, how can we execute it in the best way, right? And uh, the thing is, 
if you're joining a ton of tables, Postgres will not join them usually in the order which you put there, right? So if you're joining A, B, C, D, E, F, G, the, the optimizer is going to decide on the join order. So in this case, even if it's an explicit join, so I said X1, join X2, join X3, etc. Even in this case, Postgres will figure out, hey, X1 equals X2, X2 equals X3, so X3 is also going to be X1, right? And X5 is X1, and X5 is X3, and X4 is X2, right? So it, it will get all these equality constraints out there and decide on which join order is best, right? I mean, on empty tables, it's kind of boring, but you get the point, right? So, and what happens here is that if you're joining so many tables, planning time is not zero. So what we see here is on those empty tables, to make it really, really abundantly clear, is that planning time is a lot higher than execution time. Because there's nothing in there, but you just still have to decide on is there something in there? What's the best way to process the nothing in there, you know? So obviously, planning time is non-trivial, right? Uh, but there is a reason why the optimizer is doing that, because if there is something in the table, those 0.3 milliseconds are definitely worth the investment, right? So if you're running billions of rows and stuff like that, you want to invest time in planning in order to have a good strategy. But sometimes it's just stupid, you know, joins, etc. And what you can do here is you can nail the join order. You can tell the damn thing, don't be smart on the join order. Do as I please, right? So th there is a setting, there is a join collapse limit and from collapse limit. Let's just focus on one of them. So if you know the bloody plan, if you know that's the way to go, right? You have a query, you know exactly what's the best way. It's static forever in the day. It's always the same thing. No plan changes, you know, do it exactly that way. And I'm putting a word of caution here, right? There is a reason why there's an optimizer and not a user in charge of that. So do that when you know what you're doing, right? Everything I've shown you today is not like, add more memory, it's going to be fine, nothing can go wrong. This is high risk, you know? This is know what you're doing, right? No, know what you're doing. Otherwise, don't touch it, right? Uh, but in this case, you can see that we can uh, reduce planning time massively. So it's from 0 0.3 milliseconds all the way down to nothing, basically. Right? So that's a way to fix execution order for two reasons. Save on planning time when the query is super, super fast, meaning planning time matters relative to overall time. And secondly, when you, when you want to force a plan, right? Do, it, do this join this way. Always. Plan stability, stuff like that. Right? So th this is a very nice way of um, improvising in case it doesn't come back. <laughs> OK. So that's one way to do that. So as I said, join collapse limit defines how many explicit joins are planned implicitly. That's what it says, right? That's a very nice way of doing that to fix join order and have a mentioned word of caution, you know, know what you're doing, which is, which is a general advice, you know, know what you're doing. So, but there is more. So we started with preloading libraries to, to create connections. Then we went on to storing data, how we can, you know, reduce transaction log. Last year I've shown you column order, stuff like that. Then we had a discussion on join orders and things like that. So how about execution order? What can we do about that? So let's see. I created a nice little table, 10 million entries, I think. They're just data, right? Just a ton of data. And I have two functions. The first function says return many. And the second, fun the sec the second function says return not much. So the first function here will say, okay, if it's an odd number, skip it. 
If it's an even number, return it. So the, the left function will return 50% of the data, right? The right function will only return 3% uh, of the data, okay? But in Postgres, a stored procedure is a black box. The optimizer doesn't see that. It doesn't know that. It's a black box, right? It's, it's full abstraction. It's a black box. We don't know what's going on there, which is also true from our screen, by the way. Um, so if we're running a query that says, select everything from this table where the return many function equals ID, and then the return view function uh, equals ID, then Postgres, they, it doesn't see any difference. It's a function, it's a black box, right? So no, no difference there. But what it means is that 10 million rows will go into the first function and it will, 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 and it will return 5 million rows. And those 5 million rows will be fed into the second function, right? If we swap the order, it would be a lot cooler because we would feed 10 million rows into the second function, get almost nothing back, and then feed it into the function that is less selective, right? We would just save on a ton of function calls. So here we are at 2.6 seconds. So what we do here is, let's see what happens. So obviously the return many function will be called 10 million times, that's obvious. But the second function, the return few function, will be called five million times because there's so many leftovers, okay? So how can we approach that? How can we fix it? And the answer is alter function. By default, Postgres assumes that a stored procedure is 100 times more expensive than an operator. So. If we got A equals B, you know, it's certain cost. But if it's A function B, it's 100 times the cost. That's the constant we got here, right? That's what it is. But now we can say, hey, this bloody function up here should be considered to be more expensive because it returns more rows. So to make Postgres execute the more selective function first, to make sure that there is nothing left anymore. We just assign a higher cost value to the other one. So the optimizer will notice that it can just swap out those conditions. And at the end of the day, we, we gained roughly 20% of execution time, right? This can be super efficient if you're doing post-GS calculation, for example, because in post-GS, you have a ton of very cheap functions, like lower and upper, very cheap, right? But then you have polycons, super expensive, you know, super ugly, super nasty intersections, etc. And it might be useful to, to just tell the system, hey, do this first. And doing that first means do the cheap stuff first to make sure that nothing is left for the expensive stuff, right? And that's what you can do with alter function here. And that's also one of those hidden performance tricks, right? Where you could say, okay, just, just do the nasty stuff at the end, you know, let's hope that nothing is left, right? Very cool. Uh, what have we done, actually, with all the function? Uh, in Postgres, the Postgres optimizer is based on cost, right? So comparing a value adds cost, like calling an operator is cost, and taking a row is cost, and then using an index tuple is cost, and reading a page course is costly, and having a random page is costly. So the optimizer just has a couple of parameters like a CPU tuple cost, CPU index tuple cost, CPU operator cost, uh, sequential page cost, random page cost, uh, et cetera, to, to do the calculation on, on the queries, right? And what we do when we're talking with functions, a function is like, Treat it like an operator, because an operator is a function. Uh, and it says, CPU operator cost is 0, 0 0.5, that's the default value, and if you call a procedure, Postgres says 100 times more expensive, right? That's what it does. And what we did here is we just made it more expensive in order for the system uh, to swap out the execution plan, right? So if we got this query, just to show you again, the query says return many and return view, and it swapped out the order. 
which also means that the order in which you're placing your statement is not necessarily going to be the order in which things are executed. So that's true for join order, that's true for, uh, for expressions and a lot more, right? So what you put there is not necessarily what's going to happen, right? And this is a neat trick in order to fix execution plans. So uh, as for the summary as of today, uh, there's a lot of stuff you can really do to your system without just doing the, the obvious dumb stuff, right? Obvious dumb stuff is scale up, use more CPU, right? Dumb stuff is just pump more memory, you know? Dumb stuff is use faster storage, more IOPS, you know? That's the dumb stuff, right? But there is a lot more to that. You can load libraries faster, you can make indexing smarter, you can make your data structure smarter, you can make uh, optimization times better, you can influence execution time. So there's a lot more in the realm of database expertise than just pressing a button on some hyperscaler platform which says, I want your cache. It just has different label, it says scale, but the event at the end of the day it means just take your credit card and plunder it. Right? So that's what it is. So finally, the summary says, um, so this is, this is not a typo. This is not we are firing. This is different group of people. Uh, we are hiring. You know, there's small difference here. So <coughs> in case anybody has a passion for Postgres, and if, <coughs> sorry for that. <coughs> or if anybody wants to be my successor in case I fall dead after coughing here. So uh, um, in case anybody's looking for a job, please reach out to me or to one of my gang and thank you for your attention and have a nice conference. Thank you very much, everyone. And we have 10 minutes for questions. Yes. yes. Yeah, to reorder and conditions on on uh, store procedure calls, you can raise the cost of all the other functions, but can you set a negative cost? <laughs> I prepared a lightning talk for that <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> on negative cost. It has many more implications than you might envision. Watch the lightning talk on Friday. And in the meantime, I have to try it out. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead with the questions. I'll do the typing in the meantime, but I guess it has to be positive, right? Stephen, do you know? Uh, has to be positive. There's a foreign answer from Stephen Frost. Just trust the guy. You know? <laughs> yeah. But it has to be positive, of course, it has to be, yeah. But uh, imagine maybe nobody ever tried. I mean, I've only done this for 25 years. How shall I know, you know? So? Okay. Hmm? We could, it's open source. You mean we uh, can read a code? Yeah, we have microphones for questions, please. Yes, Wait. we have electricity. I so will go to you. And we have person with ah. question. So you mentioned... Oh, no. Uh, the index creation with fill factor 100 yes. for a read-only table. Yes. Are there situations where you would say that uh, lower fill factor is good? I had one case a couple of years ago on spinning disks where we actually went down with this fill factor to 70% because the update volume was so high that the node splits would start to be a problem. So they have contention on the, on the node splits. So we made the index larger in order to reduce contention. So I remember one case where we did that on spinning disks a couple of years ago. So yes. Here I am. And also GIST index. Taras just mentioned that it does make sense on GIST index also. Yeah. I could think of some other comments about GIST yes. indexes. But um, I was surprised that you covered join collapse limit and didn't cover the fact that the default could sometimes stand to be raised. Yes, this is an important point. I have to apologize myself. I wrote this at 11 in the evening yesterday. So, uh, What Stephen said is really important. The default value of join collapse limit is 8, which means that 8 
explicit joins will be planned implicitly. So for eight tables, it goes for join order. If you have a join over 10 tables, there will be eight of them shuffled around and two of them nailed, right? So there's also a way where you want to raise it to make sure that Postgres does shuffle it around. So it goes both ways, right? I just wasn't able, actually the true answer is, I forgot yesterday what Stephen said, but the, but the marketing answer is, I wasn't able to find an example that fits on one page, right? <laughs> okay. right. Any more question? Yeah, but by the way, if you go very high, you will end up with exponential combinations so that planning time can completely go through the roof. So if you're joining 69 tables, uh, you might really want to control that, you know? Hey, um, about that, the genetic query optimizer? Yes. Is it still usable in that case? Because I remember the definition 10 years ago, I don't know if it's usable above eight. But I wanted to ask for the question about the preloading libraries. So if we use pgpool, yes. or actually no pgpool, pgbouncer, yes. so it has connections that are already established. So the yeah. libraries are already loaded. So we yeah. have managed to work around that problem. Yeah, They're yes. loaded only I once. Mean, I mean, the preloading stuff is really if you freshly create your connection, you know, which nobody does anyway, but. This is version two, I was running out of content, I had to find something, you know. Yes, last row, please, yeah. Do we have a question? Any more questions? Stephen, are you happy with the answer? Okay, we have a question. <laughs> okay, first row. Uh, just wanted to ask if those preload libraries are visible in memory context. If I list the memory context of that session, if I will see it there, those preloaded libraries. Uh, you should, yeah, I think so, yeah. No, they're not, yeah. I never <laughs> debug this type of stuff. <laughs> I, never I never checked that. It's just deal open, that's it, right? Steven, you know. Yes, second question from Steven. Uh, well, and that's the answer, I guess. Yeah, that's the answer. Yeah, so <laughs> okay. The deal, yeah, the deal open is not going to show up inside of a. I don't really think it shows up inside of a memory context. If any, it would be in top memory context. But I don't but think. But what it shows happens up. inside the library? You but can create a context there. When, yeah, if the library accepts an allocation routine and we give it Palak to use, which a lot of them do, yes. then those will show up inside of the appropriate memory context. Yeah, that, that's, that's where I thought it should be. Yeah, yeah. but in otherwise terms of, it's just still open. It's anything. It depends on if it confirms to Postgres memory rules. Yeah, let's put it that um, way. Yeah, and then in terms of the Gecko optimizer. I mean, I've found that it's okay as long as the tables involved are not like super huge. It's it's when you start to have like really lopsided stuff that it's gecko optimizers. It, it ends up finding a local optimization that is not as good as uh, total join ordering. Um, but that also only kicks in at twelve tables by default. Twelve, yeah. So the, the thing is, at thirteen levels, you've got so many correlation errors anyway that there is maybe a theoretical best plan, which does not mean it's the practically the best plan, right? So the point is, you can make an argument, okay, this thing is producing a suboptimal plan to save on planning time, but even if you had the mathematically best plan, it would be wrong anyway, because of all kinds of joint correlation, whatever, right? There so would be in misestimation land anyway, most likely. So if you're joining 20 tables, uh, either it's, it's sufficiently, you know, small stuff where it doesn't matter that much, right? Or you want to control it anyway. If it's like 50 tables with one terabyte each, you might need an expert. <laughs> Just saying. Okay, any more questions? Anybody? Anything? Any unemployed people? <laughs> right? Any future unemployed people? <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for your talk. <laughs>